Hello class, this is Mr. Mormon. Welcome to Genetic 7C, a continuation of our video on genetic engineering. When we left off in the last video, we were talking about gel electrophoresis. Remember that when the DNA runs through the gel, it gets separated by size. The smaller molecules go further and make bands further down, and the larger molecules do not travel as far, making bands further up. Before the DNA is run through the gel, it is cut with restriction enzymes, and that's what gives you the different length segments that make the different bands. And if we use the same restriction enzyme on different samples of DNA, um, because each sample of DNA is going to have its own unique uh, order or combination of bases, you're going to end up with the a unique combination of bands for each different kind of D for each different DNA and you can use that to analyze um, or make comparisons um, to s solve a crime or prove paternity and this technology can also be used to figure out the order of the bases in a segment of DNA now, very often, in order to do gel electrophoresis or other genetic studies, um, you need to amplify or uh, copy and amplify the amount of DNA that you have. A lot of times, like analyzing a crime scene, you might get just a tiny little bit of DNA, uh, but you have to do a lot of tests, so you need more copies of that DNA. That's where PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, comes in. The technique involves heating up the DNA so it denatures, it uncoils and unzips, revealing the, uh, the DNA message, the DNA code. Then by um, applying the right enzymes, the uh, complementary base pairs are filled in on the two separated strands and you end up with two identical strands uh, to the one that you started with they are exact copies and if you just repeat this cycle over and over again you can see that you can get an exponential amplification of the dna so here's the original uh, segment of dna after the first cycle you have two copies after the second cycle four 8, 16. After 35 cycles, you end up with 68 billion copies of the same DNA that you started with. And they're all identical. So now you have as much DNA as you want to do as many different tests as you need, even though you might have started with just a tiny little bit of DNA. Okay, let's look at some vocabulary um, that will go take us a little deeper into genetic engineering. During transformations, a cell takes in DNA from outside the cell. This external DNA becomes a part of the cell's DNA. Now, plasmids are round or ring-shaped segments of DNA, which you often find in bacteria. Plasmids can be used as vectors. If you attach a new gene to a plasmid, its um, bacteria will often pick up the plasmids around them and incorporate them into their DNA. And this is one way that you can get new DNA into a bacteria. And finally, recombinant DNA, like its name implies, is when you are combining DNA from two different organisms. In this diagram, we can see how this type of genetic engineering is done. A plasmid is removed from a bacterial cell. Restriction enzymes are used to cut that plasmid open. Those ends then have the right combination um, if you use the same restriction enzyme to cut the target gene out that you're looking to insert, um, it will line up perfectly and can be spliced right into that plasmid. The plasmid then, um, if, if you use the right technique, will be picked up by some of the plant cells. Um, and now that new DNA gets carried with it and inserted into the chromosomes and then becomes part of the um, a new genome in this plant. Here's a diagram showing how the same technology could be used, again removing a plasmid, inserting a target gene, um, to create a bacteria now that has a human gene in it. We've, they've removed a human uh, gene, in this case 
In this case, the human insulin gene is being added to the plasma, uh, plasmid. Uh, the plasmid gets uh, taken up by bacterial cells, and they now have this new gene inside them. And these bacterial cells will make human insulin. Um, it could be human growth hormone or some other hormone or enzyme that we're interested in uh, replicating for treating humans. Um, what's interesting is that all of the cells that are produced from this cell from then on by mitosis will also copy that new gene and they will all be able to produce um, the insulin. And using the same method, we can get bacteria to produce all sorts of useful proteins for us. Um, and, you know, help in producing plants that are more pest resistant, bacteria that could clean up toxic waste, proteins that dissolve blood clots in heart attack therapies, or even protein, make proteins that could make snow form at higher temperatures. So there's many different applications of genetic engineering. As you've already saw, seen, uh, you can make transgenic microorganisms. Here, a gene uh, isolated from fireflies has been taken up by some of these bacteria and they now glow or fluoresce under certain light. Here we can see the same gene added to a plant. The same procedure would have been followed. You can even use the same technology to take genes um, for a pesticide protein, which is normally produced by this bacteria, uh, that gene could be removed from the bacteria and added to plants. We've created Bt corn. Bt is the pesticide. This corn is now uh, producing its own pesticide, killing the bugs, the European corn borer. What's interesting is the gene is actually only in the leaves and the stem, um, so you don't have to worry about BT contamination of the part that we eat, because we don't eat the leaves and the stem, we eat the corn kernels, and that is not going to have the BT gene in it. As we learned in class, though, there is a problem here because the pollen of these transgenic plants will also have the Bt gene in it. And unfortunately, pollen can travel long distances in the air, and the Bt gene is spreading beyond the farms where it was originally intended, and it's spreading to other farmers' crops. Um, and there's some unintended consequences here because it turns out the BT is killing a lot of the monarch butterfly caterpillars and not only this corn borer. So, um, you know, as we learned in ecology, there can be ripple effects to a lot of the things uh, that we do in ecosystems. And of course, you can make transgenic animals. These fish have been uh, genetically modified to produce a color that they normally wouldn't in nature. They're producing color genes uh, that allow them to fluoresce different colors. Um, you need a special light, a, a black light over them to make these colors come out. But of course, that's not something you would see in nature. To make transgenic animals, often you are going to treat the egg um, to create uh, an animal that is going to have new genes in it. Uh, treating the genes of an adult animal is, you know, it might affect a few cells, but you're not going to see uh, a great effect. But if you get the new gene into an egg cell, every cell produced after that by mitosis is going to have the new gene in it. Here we see a litter of rabbits where two of them have obviously taken up the uh, firefly gene. Um, they're, now, they're not actually glowing like a firefly. This is actually a fluorescence. Um, you know, it's a, kind of a, like a reflected light, for, but you can definitely see that these two are quite a bit different than the other. They've picked up that gene to produce that fluorescence. Here's the same thing in some mice. The mouse on the right is transgenic and has received human growth hormone gene. And you can see it's grown much larger than its normal counterpart on the left. And finally, I want to talk briefly about cloning. Cloning produces genetically identical offspring. They're exactly the same as the organism you get the DNA from. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about cloning. A lot of people think that it's all, you know, like magic that's done in a laboratory. But there's actually a lot of old-fashioned biology going on here. 
As you can see in this diagram, there's actually several sheep involved in creating the clone Dolly. Now here's the clone that was created. This sheep here donated an egg. An egg was removed from her ovaries. The net, this egg is then uh, denucleated. The nucleus is removed so that there's no DNA in that egg. The DNA they get from the animal that they want to clone. A cell is removed. The DNA from that cell, the nucleus, is inserted into the egg. You now have an egg with a full set of DNA. But the DNA came from this sheep. Because it's an egg cell, it will start going through mitosis and forming an embryo. Now, at this point, the embryo needs to grow into the, the baby, but we do not have any technology to do that in a laboratory. What happens is the embryo gets inserted into the uterus of a surrogate mother. This sheep then gives birth to a lamb that actually does not have any of her DNA. The DNA came from this sheep. So she gave birth to the clone of this sheep. Dolly got all of its, her DNA from this sheep here. Now, cloning is not a perfect science yet. Um, one of the problems is that clones tend to not be as healthy as the original organisms. And scientists believe that's mostly because they're getting DNA from adult animals. And DNA has a limit to how many times it can be replicated and how many times the cells can go through mitosis. So when you're starting with old DNA and creating an egg from that, um, you end up with a less healthy uh, individual. The clones tend to get uh, age-related diseases earlier and not live full lives. But as you can see in this diagram here, that didn't stop Dolly. This is Dolly when she grew up into an adult sheep from actually producing an offspring. She was, she was able to, um, to have a baby of her own. That's Bonnie there. All right, that's it for this video. Um, ask me any questions that you have tomorrow.